if you have any questions, um, maybe now would be a good time. Does, do, do any, does anybody have a, a couple of questions on the things we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, since um, not everybody can hear you, that's a good question. If you, if you run an experiment for something like a dual chamber Helmholtz resonator, which is what we have, which we think is something like a, a, a jet engine, but uh, we, do, we, we did this experiment. We've got the, the, the differential equations. We've got the data and all of this. How does this uh, relate to anybody else's experiment? And you know, the reviewers of our papers have um, asked that very, in, a, in, a, in not such a nice way. <laughs> you know, they, 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 uh, they wanna make sure that we are trying to say that it does apply to anybody else's experiment. It doesn't. Um, um, combustion instabilities, uh, again, can be broken down into four or five different uh, categories. Uh, fuel air uh, uh, oscillation can be due to mostly the air oscillating in a, either in an organ tone type of pattern or in a Helmholtz pattern. There's a possibility the fuel can oscillate, again, due to uh, not, not an organ tone, but more of a Helmholtz type of uh, oscillation. Um, vortex shedding can be a, a totally different phenomena. With a vortex shedding, though, you, um, you don't see a sharp spike in the spectrum because the acoustic instability uh, is always exactly right at one frequency, but the vortex shedding is kind of like uh, ragged and um, the spectrum is broad and, and so you can sort of see. But all of those are different and they all have different boundary conditions. Um, you really need CFD if you do anything that's not a real simple geometry. So what I'm showing you is um, an experiment that was set up that's quite simple and gives a result that can be explained by two ordinary differential equations. But you know, if you're working at a company and they have a complicated system, you've got to run ComSol or some other uh, uh, code that gives you the acoustics of a very complicated uh, system. Uh, you know, a, an organ pipe is a, a really long pipe that has a small diameter, and a Helmholtz resonator is a big, fat volume with a little tiny pipe. Those are like the two limits, right? We know that. Um, most devices are somewhere in between. And so um, a, a ComSol or some uh, commercial uh, acoustics code would be able to tell you what's happening with the acoustics if it's something in between a Helmholtz and an organ type of resonance. But um, I think we, in the research field, it's still good to pick simple experiments and try to explain them. And, and so I think Kendall is still working on um, organ tones and, and um, uh, other people are working on Helmholtz resonances and then Eventually, we will, we, but we can't take the general, re, you can't take the results from one and necessarily apply them to another. Just not, not possible. What we've learned is that uh, um, you can change the location of the fuel injection to avoid an instability, but we don't fully understand why. It just changes the, the phase angle between the heat release and the pressure field. Um, obviously, if you put all the fuel such that it all burns in a, uh, in, a, in a a vertical line and then you have the air coming in perpendicular, then you have a, a, a Reiki tube, which, which is the idealized uh, um, oscillator. Um, but in general, the fuel and the, it releases heat over a, a spatial distance. And uh, whether that's in, in phase with the pressure field or not depends on the pressure field and the heat release. So it's 
complicated. So by changing the, the location of the fuel injector, you might be able to uh, get the uh, heat release to be away from the peak of the pressure field and uh, reduce the noise. Uh, anchoring the flame is better because then the heat release can't uh, uh, jump up and down as a, you know, because that's tied to the flame. Uh, friction always helps, um, but it's something that uh, uh, people don't want to add because then you have to pump against that. So in a rocket, you can add a pressure drop to the injectors and make really small orifices, but then you have to pump uh, supercritical fluids through little tiny holes, and um, if they're too small, that's a problem. The same way with a jet, jet engine, if it's the air that's oscillating, you know, the whole advantage of the, the jet engine is you have small pressure drops if it's an, if it's an axial flow compressor and, and combustor and turbine. So it's really just a big pipe, and you want to reduce the pressure drops and you get better thrust. And if you put in a big pressure drop to get rid of the acoustics, then you're probably going to get less thrust. So, um, uh, all of these are trial and error methods. Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, skip these next slides. There were some, there were some um, questions earlier about mild combustion. So uh, let me just skip to that and say um, there is literature about mild or flameless combustion. So. The general feeling is that uh, you can have flameless oxidation and that you will reduce thermal knocks. And uh, Wooning and Wooning have a review paper, and uh, Cavalieri has a review paper, and there's another one I'll describe in the next slide by Norbert Peters. But the whole idea is that uh, a long time ago, people said a well-stirred reactor is really good because you can um, burn lean and premixed, and you keep the temperature be below 1,700 Kelvin, don't have any hot spots, and you will reduce NOx. Now, the, the rule on NOx is that to break apart the nitrogen molecule, which is the hardest molecule to break apart in, in anything we do. It's much harder to break apart nitrogen than oxygen or any of the hydrocarbons. Water, water is easy to break apart. To break apart no, the nitrogen molecule, you have to first dissociate the oxygen, and then one of those oxygen atoms has to collide, and that will break apart nitrogen. But you need fairly high temperatures. And the general rule is over 1,700 Kelvin, you'll start to see some knocks. And if you can keep everything below 1,700, not much knocks. So the idea is, could we burn all the fuel and never have it, the temperature above 1,700? Well, you'd have to premix, because, because if you have a non-premix flame, you're always going to have a region of stoichiometric, and that'll be above 1,700. But if you're premixed and lean, you, you could uh, be lower than 1,700. So this is the, uh, the mild idea. Now, um, how do you get rid of flames? Well, we don't know for sure. This is, this is what, what's been argued in these papers. But you have a high air preheat and strong recirculation of exhaust gases. And oftentimes, they cool the exhaust gases. So here's the picture in uh, in. Uh, Wooning and wooning. Uh, the combustion, uh, they take the combustion products and they cool them. And then they mix them back in because they're basically inert. Uh, the combustion products, well, there may be some oxygen in there, but there's a lot of water vapor and CO2, which are inert. And if you just put them back in, uh, you're not going to change anything because uh, they're going to contain all the heat that was generated uh, by the combustion. And uh, mixing these hot inerts back in would raise the temperature. But if you could uh, uh, take these combustion products and then cool them, you could use that energy for something, like reburning. And 
um, uh, reheating the, and, and getting a better um, uh, energy uh, output. So if you use that heat to, to heat the air coming in, it's a, um, uh, you're going to get higher thermal efficiency for the cycle. But if you take the heat out and then you put, uh, you, you, um, you put these back in in the right place and in the right way, uh, you can then, um, um, the argument is that you can then um, reduce NOx. But the idea is still you want to put things in in the right place to keep a nice uniform, well-stirred reactor. And of course, you can never achieve that. But the argument here in this paper is that if you have a large recirculation rate of exhaust gases, <clears throat> and if you have a, here's the furnace temperature, which also is related to the preheat temperature. So you want really hot walls and have everything um, heated up and so that when you put in a very lean mixture, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go out. So it's a, it's a well-stirred reactor with hot walls. And then the argument is that in this region C, you get flameless combustion. Now, uh, it's controversial because nobody's really proven that it's flameless. I don't know, is anybody here looking at flameless combustion or mild combustion? Okay, so I won't offend anybody if I say this. Uh, it's still controversial because <clears throat> uh, we don't know if there are flamelets or not flamelets because there isn't enough work done. But Norbert Peters did some work, and so you know it was good work. But he didn't know for sure it was flameless. He just built this thing with uh, wounding, and the Germans um, um, investigated it, and they did get low knocks. But it's a furnace-type device with these big, thick, uh, um, ceramic uh, bricks, fire bricks around it. They get really hot and um, they're trying to get a well-stirred reactor. Wall temperatures, they said, had to be above 800. I, I don't know why they picked 800, but they, they said it worked better at eight, above 800. <clears throat> they injected uh, fuel and then they took it out. So it's really a, it's not a, a flow-through system. It's it's something that has to go around and make a complete turnaround to get out. And so it's, it's a, a furnace type device. Uh, low air dilution, this is moderate to intense um, um, low air dilution combustion. And um, they argued that NOx drops off by doing this. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting idea, but um, I think I'll um, finish off what I wanted to say today by talking about low knock strategies. Um, uh, uh, people I know at GE and at Pratt uh, are working very hard at this. Um, Keith McManus is at GE and he's head of the um, uh, GE low knock program at, in, um, in New York State, which is a research lab. And he'll be at the symposium. And um, there are other people involved in the Combustion Institute that um, are very good and they're world experts at low knock strategies. Um, some of you may have covered this in your combustion class, but let me go over this. Before I talk about the strategies, let me talk about the, 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 the chemistry. Uh, nitric oxide is NO, nitrogen dioxide is NO2. They're both very bad to breathe, and in both cases, 100 ppm is definitely not recommended. Um, um, the NO is formed in the engine by breaking apart nitrogen molecule. NO2 is generally not formed in the engine, but it's uh, uh, mostly formed uh, outside the engine. It's a brown gas, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and so it's what, go, what you see in the smog. It's, it's, the, it's the brown cloud you see over Los Angeles, whereas NO is, is clear and colorless. Uh, both are very bad. Uh, now, 
N2O is uh, nitrous oxide, and that's not bad. That's the laughing gas, right? We know about that, right? I mean, it can be used for lasers and things like that, but it's not bad. Um, now, uh, in the uh, uh, aircraft uh, um, field, they use the emission index of NOx would be the, the a typical limit would be about 50 grams of NO of NOx, which is primarily NO per kilogram per second of fuel. So it's it's grams per kilogram here. Okay. Whereas uh, uh, when they actually build an engine, a jet engine, they have to specify the grams of NOx per second coming out per kilonewton of thrust. So obviously big engines have more grams per second coming out, um, and they're allowed to have more coming out. But this is the typical limit that uh, uh, the FAA requires. And different countries have different limits. Uh, uh, GE is a very interested in um, sticking to the limits that Sweden requires, for example, because you know you don't want to sell an airplane to to a, com a country and then they say, well, you can't fly it over Sweden, you know. So, you know, uh, even though the, uh, some countries don't have strict as strict the emission index uh, requirements, um, the airplane lasts 30 years or so and it has to meet. Um, requirements all over the world. Anyway, um, again, 1,700K, it has to be lean. You can't have it rich, because if it's rich, there's no O2. Um, uh, O2 is consumed at the flame. So typically, the NOx is produced where the equivalence ratio is between about 0.8 and 1. And uh, as we know, uh, first, oxygen and nitrogen can collide at high temperatures, and one of the, the O atoms attacks nitrogen, and, and then resulting nitrogen can attack oxygen. This is just the thermal mechanism, the Zeldovich mechanism. Now, as we know, uh, um, this NO goes out the back end of the engine, but then it sits up in the atmosphere and uh, reacts with O2, and this is over several weeks' time to form the smog that we see, and um, um, uh, the NO2 then can react with uh, the, the oxygen, since there's a lot of oxygen around, and NO2 is fairly stable. Um, I mean, it sits around for weeks, and so these two can collide and form NO and ozone. So. Uh, if you're in LA, we know that the ozone level is reported uh, by the news stations. And I don't know, years ago, uh, I was there when there was a very high ozone level, and I could really feel it. But I, I haven't, I haven't noticed it. I don't know. Maybe you've noticed ozone levels. Ozone is something you can smell. You know, when you when you have a spark, if you're near a spark, a spark plug, you can smell something that's funny. It's, I don't know if you noticed that. It's just it's kind of a, a real, kind of a bitter, bitter smell, and it's ozone. <clears throat> anyway, uh, you can produce ozone at the lower altitudes where there's a lot of oxygen. But then, if this NO goes to uh, higher altitudes, the the uh, it's it's the reverse reaction that can occur. NO and O3, the NO will react with the ozone to form NO2. And so the ozone can be destroyed. <clears throat> so this forward reaction is favored where there's a lot of oxygen. That'd be the, and no ozone. That would be the lower al altitudes. And this reverse reaction is favored where there's a lot of ozone. And that would be in the ozone layer. So the NO has two bad effects, both at low altitudes and high altitudes. And then, uh, as we discussed in my combustion class, um, Humanity would not be alive if we didn't have some way to get rid of this NO2. Um, fortunately, acid rain um, um, saves us that NO2 dissolves in, in uh, liquid water. 
And so any little water droplets will uh, um, uh, have NO2 dissolved in them and then form nitric acid, and which is, okay, I guess you'd say it's bad for the plants. It's not bad in the long run, right? It's bad if you're a plant and it falls on your leaves, you're in deep trouble. But if it goes into the soil, you've got uh, nitrogen going into the soil, that's good in, for the next generation of plants. Uh, I, I guess we can get into that debate, but, uh, but it, we do lose the... Um... And um, in my combustion class, we always do a few calculations, whether we like chemistry or not. But uh, if you look at those two reactions, the two Zeldovich, the two main Zeldovich uh, thermal Knox reactions, and then you say that O2 is in equilibrium with O, which would be a, um, this would be a partial equilibrium assumption because the NO is not in equilibrium because it's a slow reaction, but uh, this is a fast reaction, and so this is in equilibrium. So we can relate with an equilibrium constant, we can relate the concentration of O to O2. And so if we uh, replace this concentration of O with O2, and, and in the proper way, we get this. Uh, and I think I forgot the two. Yeah, I did not put the two in here. So there should be a two here. Anyway, there is the um, um, a, a, re, a reaction rate co uh, coefficient. We have an equilibrium constant to the one half power. We have a temperature which comes from here. And we have a, a concentration of O2 and a concentration of N2. And then I'm going to say, suppose we have a, 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 a uniform uh, temperature, uniform uh, uh, bath of products that look like this. Actually, they look like this. So downstream of a flame, we have a big region that looks like this. CO2, water, O2, and nitrogen. All of this is gone. This was before the flame. This is downstream of the flame. And then for uh, about 30 milliseconds, uh, fluid goes through this gas, and uh, NO will be formed. And since it's uniform temperature and uniform composition, we can we can integrate this and get this. And uh, now, um, it's fairly simple to get the concentration of O2 and N2 if we assume this fast chemistry to give you these products. Um, we can compute the mole fraction of N2 here by taking these number of moles and dividing by the total number of moles. It's about 0.75. The mole fraction of O2 over here is 3.75 divided by the sum of all these moles. And let's say it's uh, at temperature 2200 Kelvin. We look up K and Kp. And we get the concentration of, oh, uh, the, uh, the uh, mole fraction and the concentration are related just by P over RT. And we get moles per cubic meter, moles per cubic meter. So we have a lot more nitrogen than oxygen. And then we plug that into here, and we get um, a concentration. And if we do this right, the dimension should give us moles per cubic meter. And then we say that's 1,200. Well, 1,200 is really bad. But that would be in the primary zone of the combustor, where you are at 2,200 Kelvin. You very rapidly dilute this gas with dilution air before it goes into the turbine of a jet engine. And if you cool it down, um, it might drop from 1,200 to 200. And even that is not good, but that just proves you don't want to stick your head behind a jet engine and breathe that air, right? You wait for a lot of atmospheric air to come in, and it's safe. So. Um, Given that equation, what can we do? Well, uh, in General Electric, they said, well, let's keep the temperature low. Let's not get to any stoichiometric conditions. And so let's go lean, premixed, pre-vaporized. Pratt and Whitney have a different uh, 
idea which they used to call RBQQ, and I'm going to still use this, Rich Burn Quick Quench. And it's similar to what um, Ford Motor Company uses when the, they have a, a stratified engine, and uh, several Japanese engines are stratified too. And then in industrial uh, applications, they talk about stage combustion, but it's still pretty much the same as RBQQ. Um, inject fuel in many optimum locations, or even EGR, uh, after you cool the gas, and um, avoid the high temperature near stoichiometric uh, regions. Now, uh, uh, people from GE tell us that you can buy a, a gas turbine for ground-based power, and you can put a, um, a catalytic converter on the back of it, which is just platinum, like in your car. And uh, the platinum um, uh, helps to speed up the, the uh, reaction such that NO is converted back to N2 and O2. Another idea is ammonia reburn. If you throw some ammonium, ammonia, um, NH3, into the um, products, um, it will cause a reaction causing these radicals to form. And the, the, the ultimate thing is that HCN is an uh, intermediate species. But it likes to react with NO and cause the nitrogen to go back to the nitrogen uh, in NO to go back to nitrogen in an N2 molecule. So that's exactly what you want to get rid of it. The only trouble is you have ammonia if you don't do this right, and that's an issue. Yes? I, I, could you say that again? Hmm. Oh, the, yeah, the question is, could you do something to uh, after treatment of a jet engine that's actually flying in the air? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I know people have thought about it. Um, I, um, there's a problem with mixing because you don't have that much distance to do anything, right? You know, the air is actually going out close to sonic velocity, even in a commercial jet engine. and. Uh, um, the mass flow rates are so large, uh, you know, that um, not possible. Okay, now um, the GE people who come and talk to us tell us that this after treatment costs more than the actual gas turbine engine that's producing your electric power. So you know. <laughs> Very expensive, uh, very large scale, and um, there's some there is some negative effects of of any of any of this. You know, uh, so a lot of people have tried to f come up with other chemicals to put into the, the exhaust. Uh, the trouble with catalytic converters, we know they only work over a certain temperature range. So if 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 the gas is too hot or too cold, they don't the catal the, catal the catalyst doesn't work. And the same with the ammonia reburn. Um, you've got to keep the gas at just the right temperature range, or the, all these reactions don't happen. So, um, but the regulations on automobiles and the regulations on jet engines and power plants, they're going down. So whether, whether you can do it or not, it's got to be done. OK, uh, actually, let me. Let me skip to this one. Um, the, the basic idea on all of this uh, NOx is that if you, if you, this is the worst NOx situation. You just have fuel and air, and you burn it. And you, this would be like an old-fashioned furnace, OK? You see a big, lazy um, diffusion flame, turbulent diffusion flame. Now, it's rich in here. There's no NOx formed here. There's no oxygen. Um, it's, you know, the air hasn't come in. Out here, it's, uh, there's, there's air, but it's pretty cool. Now, we, we, we said earlier that the uh, contours of mixture fraction look 
look like this, and that each contour mixture fraction has a temperature associated with it. So really, the isotherms and the contours of mixture fraction are, are essentially similar. So we, we could say, that, let's suppose this, this is the stoichiometric contour, and there's a, it, there's a temperature associated with stoichiometric burning, which is maybe 2,200 Kelvin, and that's right along that point, that line. Now, as you bring air in, um, you know, air is coming in this way. Um, all the products that di diffuse and are convected away from this uh, stoichiometric contour um, will mix. So the, the combustion is occurring right along this inner line. And then there's mixing between the products and air in this uh, gray region. And we, we draw the uh, 1700 Kelvin isotherm here. And then uh, out here, it's going to be 1,500, uh, 1,200, you know, until it gets down to 300. And we're going to argue that uh, because of the uh, rate constants that are in the formula that I showed you, that uh, if the temperature drops below 1,700, basically the NOx formation essentially can be ignored and goes to zero. So this gray region is... Uh, is um, where um, NOx is produced. Now, if we could disrupt that and um, in this worst case scenario, maybe put pipes that inject fuel or air or something into this region and um, lower the temperature quicker than it, it is here. And if we could, uh, so this is stage combustion. Um, it's sort of like what I said before, you inject fuel or air in, in places and, and, and try it out and see what happens and hope the NOx goes down. And with EGR, you could uh, actually inject uh, inerts. Either, you know, and it could be done like this or it could be injected from the walls. There's lots of ways to inject uh, fluid into a device. And uh, if you inject cool inerts, you can extract the heat out of those products first and then use it and then uh, use the inerts to cool things down. So anyway, you can, you can look in the literature, there are lots and lots of low NOx devices. They all say ultra low NOx, super low NOx, you know, and they all are based on some of the staged combustion ideas. Um, as I said before, the uh, Lean premix pre-vaporized idea is to lift the flame off such that there's a lot of mixing right in here and then burn it as a stratified premix flame. And hopefully have another pilot over here to keep this from going away. Um, the people I, I've talked to admit that uh, the design is strictly trial and error, and then they do do a lot of CFD, but it's after treatment, right? You know, it's like to explain it and to optimize it. So there's a very, there's a very strong CFD group looking at these types of problems, but um, first got to cut metal and see if it works. Okay. Other, um, the other item that's um, of interest is this uh, rich burn, quick quench method of Pratt & Whitney. So uh, in the formula, we had a delta T for the residence time. And the delta T is the time that the fluid stays in the near stoichiometric zone, which would be, it have to be on the lean side of stoichiometric. And it, because it's near stoichiometric, it's very hot. Okay. So it would be like equivalence ratio between like 0.85 and 1. Actually, 1 would not be good because uh, 1 would not, be, would not produce any NOx, uh, right? Because uh, if you run stoichiometric right at that point, there's no excess ox oxygen being produced. So all the oxygen is gone in the, in the flame. But if you're a little bit, a little bit lean, some oxygen will be uh, in the products along with... Uh, nitrogen. 
Okay, uh, in the primary zone, so that, this is right where you start burning fuel and air. And this is a jet engine, but it could be an automobile engine if it's a stratified charge engine. You, you, you have primary air, you have primary fuel, you burn it, and it's nearly stoichiometric. Okay. And, um, but then you, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's nearly stoichiometric up here. It's, let's say you burn it rich in this device, It'd be rich burn. So this is a rich combustion burn, uh, zone. And then you dilute it with air through the walls, coming through the walls. And then here's where it's stoichiometric, right in here. Let's say be, uh, uh, between uh, a round fee of 0.9 in this region. And then you continue to dilute it, and you, you get a um, cooler zone. And the, the overall fuel air ratio for the, for the jet engine is around, um, uh, equivalence ratio is about 0.3. And so you've got a lot of excess air because you have to keep the, the turbine blades or whatever is back here uh, cool. But the, the problem is you have to go through this uh, nearly stoichiometric region where a lot of NOx will be produced. So the, 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 the thought of the, the, this design is to go through here as fast as possible. And so you would design such that, you know, um, uh, the gas would somehow accelerate and go through here quickly, and um, therefore the residence time in this region would be small. And you want the residence time here to be large because this is where you burn out the uh, CO and the soot. Okay, so long residence time here, short residence time here. Um, everything would be optimized. Uh, there's a, a nice paper. Um, I'm sure there are others paper, other papers, but um, um, some people at uh, uh, University of Florida, Michigan Tech, NASA Lewis, and they did a uh, numerical analysis, and they represented the picture that I just uh, sketched by a simpler geometry in which they, they have a, a, a rich burn zone, a quick quench zone, and a lean burn zone. And they draw these lines to indicate uh, where air might be added um, um, and, uh, uh, to dilute the, the, the fluid. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, I've got some other things I wanted to, um, I could cover, but I think maybe, maybe we're getting tired. Uh, do you want, want, maybe we should quit. Um, I think uh, I'll take questions. Why don't we do this um, for the next uh, half hour? Why don't we just come up and we'll go over any questions you might have. And, um, um, uh, then we will call it, uh, call an end. I, I, I really appreciate the attention that you're all giving to the Friday lecture. Uh, it's been fun, and uh, uh, with email now we can stay in contact if you, um, if you want to. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that the slides that I gave to Saha uh, were kind of um, uh, the first version. And I've just uh, sat down and given him uh, the final version, which has all of these uh, uh, slides that I just showed and a few, some that I didn't show. And uh, um, so I apologize for not having them perfect uh, like three weeks ago, but uh, I think maybe some of the other lecturers might have had that same issue. Anyway. Um, he will somehow distribute the final slides um, um, on a website, and so you, you can throw away these, which you were probably gonna do anyway, um, but uh, download um, the newer version, and I, I, uh, um, they'll, be, they'll be better.
Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's call this to an end, and what we'll do is we will, uh, uh, I'll stick around for as long as you want, we'll answer questions, okay? Oh, thank you.